Some time ago I was in a conference in another state and I preached. I don't remember what I preached exactly, but one of the points in the sermon was uh, about bitterness, you know, and holding malice in your heart and what it would do. And you know, I was uh, just uh, sitting over there this morning or one of the other days and Somebody was talking, and I got to thinking, you know, I believe it maybe was Brother Buddy, something he said, but, you know, I remember back when God called me to be a missionary, it scared me to death. I mean, it scared me plumb to death, probably just as bad as it scared in these other missionaries that are here tonight, and if God calls you, I'll guarantee it'll scare you. But I got to thinking, while Brother Buddy was talking here the other day, this morning, or something about the, the privilege that's been mine to associate with missionaries. Every every day, almost every day of my life, I'm dealing with missionaries as an international field representative. I'm either on the phone to one or on the phone for one, in the office with one or somewhere going down the road with one. And I was in a particular city in a meeting and after the service I was walking, I was uh, ringing wet with sweat and I was going somewhere to get a dry shirt or something and somebody caught me by the arm and just a little missionary's wife. They're young folk. They're just getting started, you know, eating beans and rice and just started on debutation. I don't think they had hundred, two hundred dollars a month. And her husband had been on the phone calling pastors, you know, and you'd have to be a pastor, I guess, to really appreciate that or to be a missionary to understand it. And uh, this fella called. As a matter of fact, it was right there in that city. And uh, his wife, I believe it was, answered the phone. And she put her hand over the phone and told her husband, it's so-and-so missionary. And the fella said, and of course, the phone wasn't muffled good enough, and he heard it. He said, not another one of those missionaries call me. He said, tell the bum I'm not here. He said, I'm sick nigh unto death. Well, these missionaries coming around with their hands stuck out. This missionary's on the phone listening. He said, tell him to send me his prayer card, letter, you know, etc. So uh, when she got back on the phone, he said, uh, Sister, that's all right. He said, I, I heard every word he said. And you tell him that uh, God bless him and I'm sorry that I bothered him. And so... Uh, that night, that particular pastor, pastor, and I would know him if he, if he were to walk in the door. I wouldn't know him, didn't even ask who he was, didn't want to know who he was. But that night, he was at that meeting. And that dear little missionary lady who had been living out of a suitcase, eating pork and beans, and pork and beans, and pork and beans, he drove up in his old 98, which there's nothing wrong with, and thank God, and I believe I don't begrudge a pastor nothing they have, brother. And if anybody got the short end of the stick, it was the pastor's. But you can imagine how it worked on this dear lady's heart. She's doing without. And to see the disappointment in, in her husband's face and, and all. And she was relating this to me. She came to the altar and she was having a hard time. She said, seeing him sit there and listening to him shout and, and everything. And he didn't know that this was the particular missionary that was there. He'd never met this man before. And uh, I recall, I, I prayed with her. And I told her, I said, Sister, I said, don't you worry. I said, they ain't all like that. I said, you're going to run into some. And as I was saying that, you know who I thought about? I thought about Brother Estep and the folks here. I thought about about five or six other folks that I know of. And I thank God for allowing me to be involved with missions and missionaries and tonight I want to do what the pastor told me to do he told me that he's heard me tell I guess four different stories illustrations to illustrate a point and he said he'd just like me to somehow use those so I said I guess I would I went home and I worked out an outline just to use them I've never done this before either brother <laughs> I have never worked out a message to, to, to use an out uh, uh, using an illustration and build a message around it I've never done that before but I told him I would. And if you'll open your Bibles to the book of Job. To the book of Job in chapter 14. Hold your finger there. And turn to Psalm chapter 34. The book of Job.
the book of Job and chapter 14 and the book of Psalms, the 34th Psalm. Job and chapter 14. If you have to go tonight, go ahead. There ain't no school tomorrow, anything, is there? That's right. That's just, just. And you have to admit, I was good this week. I mean, I was good, boy. 35 minutes, if you don't know how good that is. That was good. Job chapter 14. Job chapter 14, verse number 1. Man that is born of a woman is a few days and full of trouble. Now, that's a bleak statement, if there ever was one. And if you've been born of a woman, and I grant you about everybody here I know of was, I know a few that it was claimed they was hatched, but I'm sure that most everybody here was born of a woman. And if you've lived very many days on this earth, you found out that that verse of Scripture is true. And then in Psalm 34, my life's verse is found in verse 1 and 2, but the whole thing's good, but look at verse number 6. This poor man cried, and the Lord heard him. Thank God for that. But even better than that, amen. One thing to hear you, you know, I, I, I can hear a lot of folks sometimes, I can't help them, ain't nothing I can do. But said, this poor man cried, and the Lord heard him, and saved him out of all of his troubles. Our Father, Lord God, tonight, what more could we possibly say? God, what more could be done than what has been done? Father, it has been good to be here. We thank you for every missionary. We thank you for every member of this church and every visitor, anybody and everybody that had a part. But most of all, we thank you for Jesus. God, we thank you for that common bond that we all share, share together in Christ Jesus that made all of this possible. And God, if it's this good down here, oh, my soul, we're looking forward to the other side. I pray now as we take just a few thoughts and share three or four different things, I pray, God, that you'll take them and like a branding iron out of heaven, bury them and brand it into our hearts. And, Father, not that these little stories that we, we're going to tell, that, God, every one of them really happened, and, Lord, every one of them is, is there to illustrate a particular point and issue of life that, while some folks maybe have never had some of the experience, Lord, it's something that all of us can use. And I pray you'll bless now. I trust, God, that every heart and every soul is clear now. If not now, I pray before we leave that every heart will be clear. Bless, I pray now in Jesus' name. Amen. Some time ago, Brother Tim Green, some, some, most of you probably all you know Brother Tim Green, uh, he told me, he said, Brother White, he said, you ought to write a book. I said, Brother Tim, did you ever read one of my prayer letters? I said, I can't write a prayer letter, let alone write a book. I, matter of fact, I wrote a letter one time to a fellow, and at the bottom I put a P.S., and I put a whole bunch of periods, commas, colons, and doohickeys down there, and some of them buttons on a typewriter that I don't know what are for, and I said, P.S., just spread them around wherever they go. And that's, uh, you know, there's more truth to that than I really would like to admit. And uh, Brother Tim said, well, you ought to write a book. And I, I was telling the preacher today, I thought of a good title for it, the title would be, uh, what did I tell you the title was, preacher? Uh, oh, yeah, Why Me, Lord? Yeah, Why Me, Lord? And chapter number one is the unexplained explained. <laughs> chapter number two, I believe I'd call famous shortcuts and other reasons I never arrived. <laughs> and chapter number three, uh, I believe chapter three was going to be, it could have happened to anybody, but it didn't. <laughs> happened to me. And uh, chapter number four, I think, was cash flow problems or something like that. But anyway, uh, I haven't wrote the book, have no intention on writing the book, but uh, I want to share with you tonight. You know, sometimes uh, some things happen, and, and of course, uh, most of these uh, are humorous. At the time, they weren't all that humorous at the time. None of those things are at the time. Uh, you know, 15 years after falling down a flight of stairs, you can almost laugh about it then, too. But it takes a while for the pain to wear off. But you know, I've come to the conclusion that there is really no such thing as an accident to the child of God. I mean, I believe in the sovereignty of God and the providence of God. Now, I understand that many times because of our carelessness and our stupidity, uh, we get in a lot of messes. I imagine most of my messes have been on those two points more than anything else. But one time, my pastor preached a sermon on the who behind the what. 
And a lot of times there are certain things that happen in our lives. And as uh, Peter said, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial which shall come to try you as though some strange thing hath happened unto you. Uh, there are certain things and sometimes we have no idea of whatsoever. A simple matter of missing your turn off the freeway. Uh, sometimes we want, you know, I mean, uh, going down the same road a hundred times and, and you're in a hurry and miss that turn on the freeway. Get about half mad at yourself. You don't know what was down that exit off that off ramp. You don't know what God just might have kept you out of. And uh, so I, I don't believe there's any accidents really to the child of God. But I want to share some things with you. And you know, the, the, the first point in this, and I really don't know how to get started except just, just to jump off in it, and I entitled this sermon, Hurdles on Life's Path, or Hurdles Down the Pathway of Life. And all of us are going to have to face some, and some of them you clear by a, a good mile, you know, two feet. Others, uh, you catch your toe on them and fall flat on your face. And some of them, uh, you just bust right through because you don't even bother jumping. You know you can't make it anyway. You just run right through it, uh, you know, and that's the way it is. But uh, the first hurdle that we'll all face is the hurdle of ignorance. Now, I'll tell you what, brethren, some folks say ignorance is bliss. And I guess in some cases that may be the truth. But uh, in a lot of areas, you can get yourself into a lot of trouble if you're ignorant of some things. The Apostle Paul spent a great deal of his time and his energy trying and fighting ignorance in God's people. Over and over and over again, you'll hear him say, Brethren, I'm not happy to be ignorant, and so forth, all through his writings. And many of God's people are ignorant, and uh, it causes them a great deal of grief and a great deal of woe. But when you, and especially this is good for our missionary brethren, you know, uh, and more and more fellas take a survey trip. And I know I, one pastor told me he thinks it's a waste of money and so forth. Uh, I don't. I, I don't. I, I really wish I could have made a survey trip. But you know, there's nothing wrong with getting as much knowledge, not knowledge just for the sake of knowledge, but get as much knowledge about your situation and where you're going and everything else that you possibly can. When I went up to Alaska, uh, I, I, you talking about being unprepared? I was unprepared. I was born and raised in Detroit, Michigan. I was a city boy from day one. I knew nothing about nothing. I have never, I've never owned a fishing pole in my life. I, I never have. Just never. And I don't care much about fishing. I've went a time or two. I love to eat them, but I ain't got no use for catching them. I just got better things to do with my time standing there with a pole with a little spring on the end of it uh, in the water. I just never have. That don't turn my crank, you know, more or less. I just find other things better to do. Uh, matter of fact, I had a fellow one time going to take me fishing, and I told him, I said, Brother, I don't want to go. I was down in North Carolina, and I said, I always, I, every time I ever went fishing, I always get a backup lash. That's what I call them anyway. I said, my brother one time gave me a fishing pole. It was supposed to be backup lash proof. It, it was one of these uh, 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 Italian or French models, and you couldn't see the string. And he, I guess he thought maybe since I couldn't see it, I couldn't possibly foul it up. And you push a little button in the back and throw it, and just take your finger off when you want it to stop. I made one cast with that pole, and it wouldn't work anymore. We took the thing apart, and it looked like an explosion in a kite string factory inside of it. And I, I said, and I get tired. I sat there the rest of the day trying to figure out this mess, you know. And I just don't. And I told him I don't want to go. He said, "Brother, you come with me." He said, "I'll give you a backup lash." proof pole. And I said, listen, I, there ain't no such animal. He said, this one here is guaranteed. I went with that man. We got out to the fishing hole and he handed me a cane pole. <laughs> Had a bunch of string on the end of it and a bobber and a hook. And he said, preacher, you can't get a backup lash in this. And I thought, well, praise God. So I put the worm on there and I took that thing. I made one mighty cast, just a little old creek out there. And I made this great big mighty cast. I threw it up and she comes zinging up there. And, it, and I had it holding too high, I reckon, because it hit the bottom of the bobber there and it went boink and it all bounced up to the end of that pole in the biggest gob of string you ever saw in your life. I set it down and I was trying to untangle it before this fella saw it, you know. And he walked back over and he looked over and he said, Preacher, he said, he said, Lord, be in my witness. He said, you're the first man I ever seen get a backup lash in a cane pole. And uh, that's the truth of the matter. I, I just don't know anything much about those sort of, sort of things. I mean, when I grew up, I had never built a fire in my life before I went to Alaska. I was used to going over on a wall. I'd turn a little dial. I'd hear something down in the basement go, boom. And then all of a sudden, you'd stand by these little holes in the wall, and hot air would blow out. And I thought that's the way it was done. Brother, I got up to Alaska. I found out that ain't the way it's done. And, buddy, when it gets 50 below zero, you've got to get some hot air blowing out of some hole somewhere, brother, or you're in a world of trouble. And uh, I recall I, I never built a fire in my life. And I, I, I was bound to determine, I, I will grant you this, I learned how to build a fire. 
I can take a, I can build a fire. My goodness, I mean, I'm one of the best fire builders in the world, but it took me a lot of heartaches to learn how. I recall one day I went up and I'd get up at 4 o'clock in the morning and go up to the church building to build up the fire. It'd take me that long to get that fire going. We had an old fireplace up there, and one day I went up and I told my wife, I said, Honey, I said, put the pancakes on. I'll be home in 30 minutes. She said, Now, you know you ain't going to be home. She said, You'll barely get here in time to get me and the kids to get back up there. I said, No, honey, I'll be home. I got this fire routine worked out. I went and got in my truck, and I put a five-gallon can of gasoline in the back. I went up there. I was determined I was going to get a fire going that morning. I got in that building. I took those logs, and I put them in that fireplace. I had a word of prayer over the logs, too. And then I doused it down real general and liberal with a, about a, probably a gallon and a half of gasoline. I took the, the can. Thank God I had sense enough to take the can to the back side of the building. I came back, and I stood alongside of the fireplace, the fireplace being over here. I struck the match on my leg, and I threw and I was going to throw it in. I just got it right there and I didn't have to throw it I was holding the flame and that thing went kaboom and I mean it singed all the hair off of my arm it singed the side of the hair off of my I preached for two weeks without no hair on the side of my head my eyebrow I was a beating the fire out all over me and I thought well praise God at least I got a roaring inferno going and I walked around there and looked and they wasn't one ounce of fire in that fireplace it done blowed it all up the chimney or something but they wasn't none in the fireplace and every log in that fireplace was was blowed right out in the middle of the auditorium, blew over three rows of seats, blew soot all over a white floor, and I sat down in a chair and I literally cried. I said, Smokey the Bear, if I had you here, sucker, I'd choke you. I said, You're the biggest liar that ever walked in the woods. I said, You'll never convince me that anybody ever started a forest fire by throwing a match into a pile. I even tried that, bless God, and it didn't work. I struck a match and threw it and just walked off and said, Maybe it'll start, you know. That didn't even work. I said, All I had to say is this. Well, sometimes if you're ignorant, you better smarten up, amen, and figure it out. I went out and, and I, I, I didn't have a lot of support, but I was needing some extra money, and I took a contract to cut some timber. I had never cut a tree in my life. I took a contract to clear 210 acres. I had never seen an acre of ground in my entire life. I could not draw you a picture of an acre of ground. I had no concept of an acre of ground. But I took a contract to clear 210 of it. I learned what an acre of ground is. The man took me up in a helicopter way back in the bush. And man, we was in the boondocks in the bush already. We went even further back. He lit down on top of a hill and he was pointing to the map. And it looked, you know how on the map it only looks about like it's that far. But that's a long way when you get right down there in the middle of it. And he was pointing out the boundaries. He said, now I said the line goes out this way and said goes up over that hill and goes right up there in that tree line. I said, you talking about that tree line way, way over there. He said, yeah, that's the one. And he said, then it comes back and swings around down this valley. He said, and down there in that creek down to the, the far side of that bank over there. I said, wait a minute, you're talking about that creek way down there. He said, yes, sir. Man, I said, I'm in a mess. I went and I got my chainsaw. I never held a chainsaw in my hand in my life. I never ran a chainsaw, didn't know nothing about it, but uh, I was going to do it. And I got out there, and I, I know how, I mean, I mean, you know, I, I, I'm macho. I know how to be a man. I threw that saw over my shoulder like I'd seen some of them lumberjacks do up there. And I walked out there, and I know, I know how you do it. You pull that thing, and then you stick it on a tree, and you say, timber! You know, and she falls over. Any fool can cut down a tree. And so I got up there. I got me a pretty good size one up there. And I mean, there's a bunch of trees in 210 acres, I'll tell you. And I got that old saw, and I, I, I was down in southeast. I went way up there. Uh, where uh, Lime Village is. I mean, these trees grow big down there, buddy. And I got that sawing. Man, I, 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 matter of fact, I even felt kind of good, you know. I was standing out there, brrr, you know, all that sawdust blowing out. I felt like macho duck in person. I mean, I was just going, brrr, and so I said, and I heard it crack. It made this awful sounding crack. And I pulled the chainsaw out, and I didn't bother hauling Tim Burke because there wasn't no other fools out there besides me. And I saw that thing, and all of a sudden it started to fall, but it didn't fall the way it was supposed to. It started falling right back toward me. And buddy, I took off a running. I grabbed that chainsaw and I headed out. And all of a sudden, and only God's grace kept from just, it would have crushed me flat in a flitter. But that thing come crashing down. It just looked like the whole world turned green. I mean, the whole thing crashed down around me. And then when I, I 
I was, I was waiting to hear the crunch. And there's these two big limbs about that big that just went on either side of me and kept that tree from just falling on me. And there I was laying on the ground on my back and I had that hot muffler against my leg. Oh, I, and I couldn't, I couldn't move. I was trying to get out of the way. And I was laying there and I thought, now, what am I going to do? I tried to crawl out. Crawl out. I tried to get my pocket knife out. I was going to cut my way out. I said, man, I, I just squiddled on that big limb there. Couldn't move my hand harder no more than that. I said, I'm never going to get out of this. And there's a lot of wolves around there. And I heard these wolves way off in the distance. And I started cutting real quick, you know. And I said, man, this ain't. And I said, I'd holler for help, but the nearest help's 20 miles away. I said, wow, what am I going to do? And I laid there and the mosquitoes. Oh, you'd have, man, you'd have to be up in Alaska to appreciate the mosquitoes. Oh, my soul, they got mosquitoes up there. I'm just telling you, between the mosquitoes and the gnats and the little things they call no see but they just eat you alive. And I mean, them gnats just flying around. And I tell you, ain't nothing more pestering than a gnat. But when you can't get up there to slap them, it's, it's just terrible. I, I mean, it's flying up and crawling up my nose. And I was going, man, I'm blowing boogers out of everything, trying to get them out. And so finally I laid there and I, I said, well, if I'm going to get out, I'm going to have to get myself out. Ain't nobody going to get me out. I prayed and God didn't even send Gabriel down. And I got that old chainsaw. Did you ever, I'll tell you, you go home and try this. Lay on the living room floor and lay a chainsaw down and put your leg half on it and then try and pull it. I couldn't pull it out further than that. I go, brum, brum, trying to get it to start. And I worked and I worked and I sweat and I sweat it. And I kept I'm trying to pull it. And finally, and I went, and I went, and I cut my boot. Matter of fact, I still got a mark in my boot where I cut my boot. And I finally, I cut my way on out. And I finally got the 200 some odd acres cut. But during all of that, I learned a whole lot. And there's still a whole lot of things I'm ignorant of. But I know how to start a fire and I know how to cut down a tree. But I didn't learn nothing else. And you know, I found out about some of these hurdles in life. You know, uh, uh, you ought to take everything as a learning experience. One, one missionary asked me, he said, Brother White, he said, uh, another story I'm going to tell you about in a little while, but he said, Brother White, he said, why do you suppose that that happened to you? I said, so it wouldn't happen to you. I said, that's why, that's one of the reasons why. So as it won't happen to you. And so, as, uh, I said, you see, you ought to take every thing in life as a learning experience. And, okay, so you have been down the rock pile. I mean, just, if you have to go down, go don't, don't go down for the same thing. I mean, don't make a return trip. The second hurdle in life. Now, after you get over your ignorance, and you begin to get a, you know, it's great when you first get saved that you don't know a whole lot. <laughs> oh, I'm telling you what, if I'd have known all of this when I got saved, I, I think I'd have stuck a gun in my mouth and pulled the trigger. I mean, really. Say, well, it's great. Yeah, it's great, but man, them rock piles ain't so hot. And if I thought, I mean, when God saved me, if I thought, if I knew God was going to call me to preach, I'd have fainted. I'd have had a heart attack. I didn't know all that God was going to I didn't know what all this stuff was all about. I didn't know all that. And thank God, in some cases, ignorance is real blissful. But after you've been around a while, you've been in a few mission conferences, you've been out on deputation a while if you're a missionary, you've been out on a field, uh, the scales fall from your eyes in some areas, and then you know the next thing that sets in the next hurdle, and that's the hurdle of fear. Yeah. Fear. And brethren, uh, there's a proper type of fear. The Bible says in Proverbs, was it 1 7, it says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. But the problem is, uh, too many folks, they're scared of the wrong things. They're just scared of the wrong things. The average Christian. But they see a circumstance and they cringe in fear. And because of the circumstance, real or imagined, it causes them fear and they, they back off from doing anything because fear takes over. I was on an airplane coming from uh, uh, Detroit, Michigan, going down to Cincinnati. I finished a meeting up there. It's been a couple months ago. And I always, as I said, I always ride on the same seat in the airplane all the time. And I got on, and there was two ladies who got on before me. And they were sitting, one by the window, one in the middle, and I had the outside. The dear sister over by the window, uh, she's a black lady, and she'd go about 450, uh, 450 pounds. She was a heavy-duty girl. And then the one sitting next to her, uh, she's just a little thing, about 300, I'd say, 325 pounds. And she's sitting in the middle. And then sitting on the aisle seat was me holding down that, that end of the aircraft right well. What? No, no danger, no wind blowing us over on that side anyway. I really thought the plane was going to fly like this all the way to Detroit. And I was glad they got on first. 
because I sat on that lady's leg all the way to deep, all the way to Cincinnati, and had it been twitched around, she'd have sat on my leg all the way because there wasn't no place else to sit. Them seats ain't been so big. And I mean, we are smushed, <laughs> smushed up close. And uh, I got to talking to these ladies. They came on. They said, we're going to have to delay the flight 30 minutes. The Cincinnati's fogged in. We can't leave. So I thought, well, I'll start witnessing. i start witnessing these ladies. They're both Christians. And we talking a little bit. And I had some fairly good fellowship. This one cringing a little bit because I was sitting on her leg. I think I cut off the blood supply. But she's very kind about it. And so finally they came on. They said, well, we're going to leave. We sat there 30 minutes. We're going to leave, but it's still socked in. But when we get there, it's supposed to clear off. So we took off. And we was flying eight, but about 35, 40 minute flight. And so we circled around. And man, I mean, you look down, it just looked like a blanket. And so the pilots started coming down. These two ladies, as soon as that plane left the ground, and neither one of them had been on an airplane. And boy, I mean, you tell you, they were scared. And we started coming down through that fog. And that one lady, she looked out the window. Her eyes got that big. You couldn't see nothing. I don't know why they got so big, but they got big. And she was over there, and we come down. And you know, I don't know if you've ever been on a, a plane when, when uh, they have instrument approaches, there's certain things they do. And if they have what they call a missed approach, they, have, uh, they get down to a certain elevation. And by the books, if you cannot see the ground, when you get to a certain elevation over the ground, you're, you have to uh, uh, execute a missed approach. You hit full power, and you go around again and come down and try it again. It's just a procedure. I've never been on more than one, well, except this plane. I was on some others that missed one approach. I've never been on any others that ever missed more than one. We came down, and uh, uh, he got down there. We kept getting lower and lower and lower and lower. I peeked out, couldn't see nothing. I figured, man, we're going to miss this approach sure enough. And so he came in, and all of a sudden you could feel that plane shutter he firewalled that thing and then he started on a 45 angle banking climbing turn according to the uh, 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 approach plate that he was following and he started and that old plane just started shaking and the uh, wheels went up made that booming sound when they got up in there and that old dear old colored lady must have jumped the foot off of that chair i mean to tell you brother she got her hands together and she started praying she said oh merciful jesus merciful jesus i mean to tell you she was was praying and uh, she got this other lady a little bit nervous next to her this other lady dug in her purse and she pulled out a great big Bible she throwed it down in her lap and she whipped it open to where her marker was she threw the marker out she threw her hand her right hand on the book she put her left hand in the air she said merciful Jesus oh merciful Jesus and I was sitting there, I said ladies listen this is just normal routine I said ain't nothing to be afraid about I said just said we just uh, we just had a missed approach she said I missed a what Oh, oh, she said, I knew we was in trouble. She said, I said, no, ma'am, we ain't no trouble. Just normal. She said, look out that window. She said, I can't see nothing. And you know that man up there can't see no more than I can. So we're in trouble. He made us another approach. He turned. He came back down. And boy, he got down there. And this old girl just pouring it on. And you know, the wheels went down that thud again. And she jumped again. And come down and got closer. And they got closer. And they got closer. And I said, oh, I hope this plane gets on the ground. I mean, it's about to scare me. And just, man, one, that one lady, she was shaking. I, was, I mean, she was really scared. She just shaking all over. And her leg right on her mind. Just going like this, you know. And I, I was trying to sit there. Hey, have you ever tried to be cool? And when I'm, I mean, you know, you're trying to be sophisticated and you're sitting there going like this you know because this other lady's jerking so bad you know we got down there and all of a sudden missed another approach I mean, he firewalled that thing. That old plane took off. And I mean, the wings just a shuddering on it. And boy, this one girl, she just a screaming and a hollering and calling all kinds of attention. And I said, ladies, really? I said, this, everything's all right. She said, listen, you said you was a preacher. She said, if you're a preacher, she said, why don't you pray? She said, get a hold of God. I said, man, you know, that ain't a half bad idea. <laughs> so what'd you do, man? I said, merciful Jesus. <laughs> I said, get us out of this mess. Well, we got on the ground, you know. And when they got on the ground, I mean, I thought they were going to kiss the ground. And they was really afraid. I mean, but they're probably, they're afraid of the wrong thing. Amen. Yeah. Now, I, 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 I have a kind of a warped sense of humor, I guess. But here the other day, and I, don't misunderstand me, but you know that one plane over there crashed in Dallas, and all the folk in the back got out. So everybody bought their ticket for the back. I told my wife, I said, men are crazy. The back ain't no safe in the front. The next wreck over in England... Everybody in the front got saved. And I, I don't know, I, I looked at that and I said, man, now if that ain't a joke, I'll tell you what. All those folks and probably uh, stood in line to get a prime back seat. And they became crispy critters for it. Well, listen, you, you know, I mean, you better be prayed up, friend. 
Whether you're sitting in the back or in the front, over the wing or what, you better be prayed up. And memorize the exits. That's always good too. <laughs> but fear. But you know I found out that most of the time, most Christians and missionaries, everybody included, most of the time we invent boogers and everything that don't exist. We spend all of our time wrestling with a, con a conjured up something that really is dead. Which brings me to my next story. The day Brother Jim killed the dead bear. I became famous for that in Alaska. I was in Alaska. I had never killed anything bigger than a rabbit. And this dear Indian fellow whom I led to the Lord, he was going to take me bear hunting. I said, all right, I'd like to shoot me a bear. I, I, finally, I finally killed four, but the first one about put me out of bear hunting business. Went out in the woods, and he, he didn't have a gun. He just went around with me for the ride. And he pointed out this bear. Great old big, biggest black bear I've ever seen in my life. From the tip of his nose right up in here after I had him skinned out, down to the butt of his tail is six foot. Now, that's a big bear. for That's big anything. And uh, he said, right out there he is, preacher. Well, I couldn't even see him. I said, what are you talking about? He said, right over there. He said, about 80 yards away. And I looked, and sure enough, there was one. I had a 30 out 6 with a scope on it. I put her up there like Davy Crockett. I come down on that old bear, and boy, I was so excited. And I guess I must have wiggled a little bit, because I, boom, and I hit him, but I hit him down here somewhere. No bear spun around and was clawing at his side. And then he took off running straight up that hill where we was. And here he come. And I mean, they're fast, brother. And uh, Oh, Brother Herman said, shoot him again, preacher. Shoot him again. Well, I didn't want nobody to think that. I didn't know what was going on. I just racked in another shell like Bawana Don. I said, you got to stay cool, calm, and collected. Don't panic. I calmly raised my gun up. But that bear wasn't really going, he wasn't too, he was excited. I was calm, he was excited. And when I put it up again and I come down on it and I look through the scope and that bear got so close that it looked like the, this top of this pulpit here looked like somebody hung a black rug up in front of that scope. I couldn't see nothing. All I could see was black fur rippling, you know. I said, oh, whoa, man. I know I ain't got but one shot left. I ain't very smart, but I didn't come to town on a load of pumpkins, amen. I know that I only had one left. And I was trying to peek around the scope and it didn't have a peephole under it. And, and, and Brother Hermie says, uh, go ahead, shoot him again, preacher. I said, yeah, okay, okay. And I was trying to peek around. He said, shoot him, preacher, shoot him. And I said, yeah, all right. And I, he's good about, my feet saying, run, fool, run, run, run. And I said, don't panic, don't panic, don't panic. I said, I got everything under control. Just, and that bear man, he's coming for all he's worth. And finally, all of a sudden, I heard a rustling in the bushes. And here's old Herman, man. He's just hauling down the road. And he said, shoot him, preacher, shoot him. And I mean, I wanted to join him in the retreat. I'm telling you, but I knew that bear would catch me sure enough. And I knowed I wasn't going to catch that Indian. I don't believe the bear would have caught him. And so I didn't know what to do. And I said, Lord, direct this here bullet. That bear, I was on top of a little knoll, and he'd come up over it. And oh, I'm telling you, it's one thing to see him in the zoo between the bars. It's another thing to see him stuffed out there in a the lobby. But all when you get in their own hometown and you see him huffing and a puffing and slobbers dripping out them fangs, them big claws, and here they come and blowing stuff out of their nose. And buddy, he got up there and I dropped it down like this. I knew I couldn't miss point blank cranes. I wasn't any further, I guess, from here to where the preacher was. And I was going to just pull the trigger. I was going to throw him the gun and I was going to run. Just about that time, I said, I started saying, oh, God, and I was going to pull the trigger. And I said, oh, and I scared the bear, I reckon, because he stopped. And all of a sudden, he run off that way. And I waited till he got out, and he started climbing up over an old snag. And I let him get out there, and I said, kaboom, and I got him. And I ran out back of the head and killed him. So my heart's going, blah, 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 blah. I said, hey, Herman, come on back, buddy. I got him. Try that cool. Like I do this every day of my life. I come on, brother, I got him. So we went over and I put my gun up against the tree. I had a 357 and I took it out. We poked him with a stick, made sure he's dead. Took my gun out, stuck it in his old ear, and I said, kaboom, put the old coop de grass on him. Ain't no more problem than that dude. So holstered my gun. We got down there, we was gonna skin this old bird out. And we got to working. And uh he's down in this gully thing. So I got down under the bear. We're trying to roll him over. I got under him, had that big paw up over my shoulder, and I was a pushing for all I was worth. 
Herman had him by the back of the neck on the shoulders pulling him by his fur. And I was a pushing. And all of a sudden the old bear rolled. And when he did, I went poop and I right on top of that bear, right on his chest. Well, I didn't know it, but he had some air trapped in his lungs. <laughs> and when 200 and some odd pounds squished down on his chest, it of necessity forced the air out of his lungs. And his head was right there, his mouth right by my ear. So it sounded worse than it was. But all of a sudden I heard something. <laughs> and if ever my blood ran cold and my heart stopped, it was then. Man, a lie. I thought, he's got me. He's got me. And thank God I didn't think of my gun. If I would have, if I'd have thought of that 357, I'd have holes all over me. All I could think of was my knife. I rolled over and I whipped out my knife. And I got that bear by the neck. And brother, I mean, I was a plunging that knife. Whomp, whomp, whomp. And man, I was, and I had all the bear, see. And I was wrestling him while his air arms was a flaring like that. I thought he was fighting. It's just me pulling him around. I mean, brother, the old adrenaline got to pumping. I was sinking that knife in, clean up to the hilt. And I know it had to be adrenaline, because about an hour later, I tried it once more. I couldn't get it to go in two inches with all my strength. You know, Herman, I noticed out of the corner of my eye. He's laying on the hill, holding his side, and he's laughing. I said, Herman, get the gun, get the gun, get the gun. And he said, no, preacher, no. He said, no, you're ruining the rug. I said, get the gun, fool, get the gun. I thought when I finished with this bear, I said, God, you let me live through this. I'm going to kill that Indian. Well, I finally totally exhausted myself. I know I stabbed him. I believe Herman said, we counted some of the holes. Did ruin the rug. About 17, 18 times. I, I just rolled off of that bear. Laid there and let my heart settle back down. Herman was just, he was rolling still. Tears running down his eyes. I said, oh, I knew he was dead. He said, uh-huh, yeah, uh-huh. I said, yeah. I said, oh, wait a minute, Herman. I said, you know, we get back to town. There ain't nobody has to know about this. I said, I don't see no reason in the world to tell anybody about it. Oh, he said, Brother Jim, I wouldn't do anything like that to you. I wouldn't tell anybody. I was afraid he thought I might kill him if he said he would. We no sooner got back to the village. Well, boat pulled up in there. There's four or five Indians on the dock. Oh, Herman jumped off. He said, hey, he said, wait, I got to tell you this. Why do you hear this, man? Well, Brother Jim killed a dead bear yesterday. <laughs> Whole town knew about it. And there I was wrestling with something that, honestly, I mean, at the time, at the time, I thought that I was at death's door. I thought any moment I'd feel those, uh, uh, those uh, canine teeth sinking in my juggler pain. I thought any minute I was a goner. And, brother, it was just as real as anything. But you know that's how most of your battles are. And most of those fears and... Oh, you look up here and say, Oh, good night. Next week, I don't know how long you're going to leave this up here, brother. You ought to leave it at least a week. Because somebody's going to look at that and say, Oh, man, you mean I done that? It was one of them emotional tizzies. It must have been. Surely the goodness that thing, you got my name on it. And you'll begin to wrestle with some dead bears. They're dead and they can't hurt you. Oh, circumstances and, and, and pressure applied. It, it might force some whole dead air out of their lungs and it might growl real bad. But most of the time, it doesn't add up to anything. It doesn't add up to anything. But then after you've been in a few battles and you find out, whether you're a missionary, pastor, or Christian, whatever the situation, and, and, and you come from ignorance... And you see some things and, oh man, it scares you to death. But then you find out most of them are just dead bears. Most of the time the devil's bluffing. He's just bluffing most of the time. Most of the time. Not all the time, but most of the time. Most of the time that's all it takes. But then you come to another hurdle. And this is one of really, one of the worst of the bunch. Matter of fact, this one gets a whole lot more people than the others. And that's the hurdle of pride. Say, so, Man, I whipped them problem pretty good, didn't I? <laughs> hey, go look at that bear skin. Look how many holes I put in that thing, man. That was just a phony one. Just think what I'd done if it had been the real thing. Don't even think about that. 
But if you're not careful, and you get out in the fight and listen, and you don't have to be no missionary, you don't have to be no preacher to get in the battle. How we need some folk in the battle right now. And the battle's just not for missionaries. It's just not for preachers. It's for everybody. And friend, listen, if you'll sell out to God, God's going to put you in some battles sure enough. There's some hot battles right around here, friend. But after you've been in a few battles, you get a few battle scars. And you find out that God's taking you through. And, and every once in a while, you even get a battle ribbon. Remember when I was in the service, most of them are just, we called them gee-dunk ribbons. And what that was, that didn't mean a whole lot. But they sure looked pretty up there when you went into town and all the girls were like, oh, man, look at this, man. I never wore my coat. I don't care 50 below, man. I didn't go wear a coat cover up that stuff. <laughs> Are you crazy? But most of them just gee-dunk. Not it didn't mean a whole lot, but nobody else knew that. You should have heard what I told them that was. <laughs> I didn't tell them it was for cleaning the garbage cans real shiny. I told them some good stuff, you know. And, uh, but you get a few battle ribbons. And you get a few campaign buttons. And you've been in a few real fights. And I tell you, there's nothing more exhilarating, there's nothing greater, rather than going toe-to-toe -to -toe and eyeball-to-eyeball -to -eyeball with the enemy and seeing God bring it through and watching God work the victory and watching the enemies of God put the route and run it away. Well, I'll tell you what, that'll stir you up. But if you're not careful, if the devil can't get you with the fear, he'll get you with the pride. Proverbs 8.13 says, The fear of the Lord is. Now, the Bible said that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. What is the fear of the Lord? Proverbs 8, 13 says, The fear of the Lord is to hate evil. And then there's a colon, I believe, there. And it lists, it says, Pride and arrogancy. That's the first two evils that he lists in that part. Again, in Proverbs 6, 16. It says, These six things doth the Lord hate. Yea, seven are an abomination unto him. And the very first one in verse 17 is a proud look. A proud look. And a lying tongue. And it goes on down and mentions several things. There's no way in the world you can use pride in a good sense. You, you, can, no, you can no more use pride in a good sense than you can use adultery in a good sense. Now I understand, you know, folks, when we talk about being proud of this and that, I understand what folks mean and all. When we come right down to it, there is no way to use pride in a proper term. I don't care what the Marine Corps says, uh, that, that's, it's not right. It's just not right. can't use it in a good term. Pride, the Bible said, only by pride cometh contention. Right. In a church, when there's contention, rather you follow it back, and somebody's proud as a peacock. Pride. Now, we got ways of dressing it up so it don't look so bad, you know. Nobody wants to think of it as some proud, pompous peacock. There's some folks that never say anything. You never hear them, they never stand up, just as proud as the one that pratting fool that walks and struts his stuff. There's, and I don't have time to develop that because that's not what I'm doing. But what I want to get to is how God takes care of that. Some time ago, my, well, no, I'm not going to tell that story. That's a different story. One time I was, I'll tell you the most, uh, this ain't the one the preacher wanted me to tell, but I'm going to tell this other one because it it'll get up my courage to tell the real one. Because the real one's worse than this one. And this isn't bad enough. The most embarrassing experience that ever happened to me. Matter of fact, I don't believe I've ever told this publicly but once. And that was because some dumb preacher asked me to, too. I don't want to tell it. I'm no, no reference, brother. No reference to you at all. <laughs> I, my wife and children and I were somewhere. I was preaching. Been years ago. And uh, <clears throat> I got to this church. It's a big church. And I, I, I was going to... I was going to impress these folk. No, not really. That's not what I called it. I, I, I was going to put on the dog for the Lord, you know. And I got there, and I, I was Sunday morning, and he was Sunday school, and I was morning service. But I wasn't settled on what to preach, and some of you preachers know how that is. Then I sat there, and I'm up on the platform. I said, oh, man, I got to, Lord, I'm going to pull out one of them dry ones and warm it up if you don't give me something. And I thought I had a thought. But then the Lord gave me a thought over in the Bible, and I said, boy, that sounds good. I got to work that thing around. And so I told the preacher, I said, brother, I said, I got to go to the bathroom. I said, be right back. He told me going down. I went down the stairs, and I went straight down the stairs, and I come to the bathroom, and I went right in. When I went in, I saw a, a a vanity over there and there's a can of hairspray sitting there and some bobby pins but for some reason it didn't register that bathroom was pink that didn't register they had three stalls in that bathroom 
with these little curtains. Didn't have doors, had curtains. Little flowery looking little curtains. That didn't register. I had one thing on my mind. I had a sermon. I opened up the middle one. I went in and I got very comfortably situated on the throne. And I got my Bible out. And I was at work. Oh, I said, glory to God, I ain't never seen this before. Man, I was just at work. All of a sudden the door opened and I heard something that sounded familiar like high heel slippers. And I listened for a minute. I said, nah, nah, couldn't be. And I was working. And this dear lady came in the one right next to mine. She got in there. And I heard a swishing of a dress in nylons. I said, now, oh, wait a minute. I, I, I've heard, heard that before. You see, I, I, I got a wife and three daughters. I live in a girl's dorm. I mean, man, around my house, you know, you go to the bathroom in the morning, first thing, the pantyhose monster attacks you, you know. You got to fight your way through all that junk. So I know all about that kind of stuff. I'm the only man in our house. And I said, I, I've heard that before, but th th this ain't the right place for that sound. It's not supposed to be here. And I sat there and I said, no. wait a minute. You know how the partitions are, you know, on the sides. That for some reason, they don't put them all the way to the floor. They're about this high. So I bent down and looked. Sure enough, here sets two high heel slippers. Little red slippers. Open-toed sandals. Prettiest little pink toenail polish you ever saw in your life. And I said, that poor woman, bless her heart, she done got in a man's toilet by mistake. Poor little thing. I still didn't want to admit defeat. And I was sitting there wondering what, and I don't want to embarrass this girl. And I looked up and I saw these little flowers on this little thing. And they're like a ton of bricks. I saw that can of hairspray when I walked in. And I saw them three, four bobby pins. And I said, oh, no. I'm in a woman's restroom. Oh, God, how did I do this? And I sat there and I said, what am I going to do? What am I going to do? I said, Lord, I ain't never been to this church before. This man don't know me from Joe Doe, from Kokomo. Oh, oh what am I going to do? I said, and you know, and I got to, I said, oh, my goodness. If I can see her feet, she can see mine. And I whipped them up. And then I got to think, man, there ain't no door lock on it. It's just a curtain. I, and I grabbed that curtain. And I sat there. And you try this when you get home. You hold your feet up about a foot and a half off the ground for a while, brother. You're talking Charlie Horse, man. I'm talking bad news. I begin to cramp in my thighs. And I, if somebody would have pulled that curtain at all, it would, I'd have had a death grip and it just flopped over and I'd been peeking out. They wouldn't have got it open. And I said, then I'll tell you what, you talking about praying. Oh, you talking about praying. Praying high didn't have nothing on me that day. Brother, I was confessing ever since. I was making them up to confess. I mean, I said, oh God, I'll do anything. I said, Lord, get me out of this mess. Oh, I could just see it now. Sex pervert arrested. Carted off to jail. I said, oh my whole ministry's gone. It's all over. What am I going to do? And the Charlie horses are cramping my legs and tears are running out my eyes. And I'm a praying. And I thought my heart's about to be to hold my t-shirt. I thought everybody could hear it. And boy, she got done. Oh, soon she got up. I jumped up. was in walked two more. I sat back down. I raised my feet up and I held that curtain. I said, oh, Lord, what am I going to do? And at one time I had one on each side of me. I had a couple out there at the sink and, and they're talking lady talk. Oh, oh, you're talking about it. Oh, embarrassed. I didn't know what to do. I said, oh, God, I was going to just go and stick my head in the toilet and flush it till I drowned it. I didn't know what to do. And I said, Lord, if you just let me out of this mess, I promise I'll always read the signs. I said, God, I'll read them if they're in Braille. God, I'll take Braille. I'll take Spanish. I'll take Hebrew. I'll take anything. Oh, God, just get me out of this mess. Well, upstairs, they're waiting for Brother White. They're singing, and they're singing, and they're singing. He sent a man down. He said, go see if Brother White's all right. He went down to the restroom. He ain't come back. He went down. He come up and said, preacher, he's not in there. I wasn't. I was on the other side of the wall. And finally... Everybody got out again. I, I was in there about 15 minutes. And 15, it seemed like a, oh, it seemed like an eternity. Man, I jumped up and I was going to get out of there. And then walked another one. I sat back down. I said, oh, God, I can't, my nerves can't stand it. Lord, I said, I'm going to scream. I said, God, I'm just going to start hollering. I said, I'm, I'm just, Lord, i got to get out of here. i got to get out. And then I heard this lady. She was over at the sink and she was humming. It sounded like my wife. I said, now, Lord, I'm going to peek out. Please, please, Lord. It'll be bad enough if it's my wife. But God, please let it be my wife. I never wanted to see my wife so bad in my entire life. 
And I started peeking. I said, I can't do it, man. If I, there's a mirror over there, and if I peek out and it ain't my wife, she see. oh, I can hear her now screaming. I can just see the ushers running in, grab me by the collar and pulling me out. And I said, oh, God. So finally, I said, i got to do something. So I said, hey, Jude, is that you? Death silence. I thought, oh, God, it's not her. And all of a sudden, she said, Jim. She said, Jim. She said, is that you? I whipped that curtain back. She said, you know where you are. What are you doing out here? I said, Mama, listen, I can explain everything. There is a logical explanation for all of this. I said, but honey, listen, we ain't got no time to talk. I said, get out of here. I said, honey, I ain't never hit you in my life, but I'll whip you if you don't move right now. I said, I ain't got time to explain. Get out. Don't you let nobody. I said, I don't care what you do. Don't you let nobody in here before I get out. And she went out and stalled them off. And when I came out, she was talking to the song leader's wife, and I walked right between them. I said, hello, and walked right out. Walked up the stairs, and I looked back. And the lady, she looked at me. She looked at the sign. She looked back at me. And right there, I level. I don't know how I missed it. You'd be blind as a black man. On a white door, black letters, three inch black letters, said women. Right, you couldn't miss it. But I missed it. I missed it. You're talking about getting your balloon deflated. <laughs> Tell you what. Preacher's 9.30, I'm going to skip the motorcycle rack. No. Oh. That one ain't been long enough to get the, over to hurt, brother. <laughs> well, I was in, I heard this up, I was in, Around, uh, I took a trip to visit missionaries, and I, I went to the country of Nepal, country of Nepal, south of, south of China, north of India, and I wanted to go up to the China border. I ain't never been there. And this dear missionary, he had some preacher will have to ride motorcycles. He went out and got me a motorcycle, a big motorcycle, because I'm a big man. And uh, he told me, he said, "Now preacher, it's a one down, four up," which I didn't know what that meant. I thought that was the model number or so. I found I had something to do with the gears later on. But if you'd asked me, I said, that's a one down, four up I got. And he said, now, preacher, do you know how to ride a motorcycle? I said, do I? Do I know how to ride a motorcycle? I said, hey, evil, Knievel ain't got nothing on me. I said, sure, I know how to. I, I've never been on a motorcycle in my life. I don't know nothing about motorcycles. But I want to go up to China. We got ready to go, and his dear little wife. Miss Mary, she came and she told me, she said, Brother Jim, I want to talk to you. Yes, I said, yes, ma'am, Mary, what, what can I do for you? She said, Preacher, you know about this trip up to China? She said, no, Preacher, I just don't feel real good about this. I've been praying about this. I said, oh, don't worry, sister, everything will be all right. We're not going to go over. We're just going to go up and look at them Chinamen and take some pictures. Oh, she said, I'm not worried about that. She said, Brother Jim, that's a long way through them mountains. And said, you know, we know you've got some physical problems. And said, boy, you know, we've been praying. And she said, Preacher, I just don't think you need to be sitting on no motorcycle. I said, now, listen, sister, everything will be fine. She said, but Brother Jim, do you know anything about a motorcycle? I said, do I know anything about a motorcycle? I said, sister, man, I wrote the book on it. I know all the reasons. I said, don't worry about everything. Be fine. I said, just, you're as bad as my wife. I said, just go stir the grits. I'll take care of everything else. I said, man, these women, good name. Well, she said, brother Jim, I just don't. I said, just, just go do, do the housework, man. I'll take care of this other stuff. Boy, we got out there, and I mean, it was fun. I'm driving up through the Himalaya Mountains. Mount Everest out there in all of its splendor. Here I am on a motorcycle, wind blowing in my hair. What I got left anyway. Now I'm just going, having a great time. We'd stop off in these little villages and pass out tracks. And boy, I, man, I just having a time. And we got down and the missionary was in front. And apparently a truck had come by and a can of kerosene or something fell off. And it made a big old puddle in the middle of the road. It was a blacktop two-lane highway. Missionary went around it. Well, I thought, he don't know nothing about riding motorcycles. Hey, what did I show him what I can do? I was going to make a big splash in it, you know. I said, like, man, I hit that thing. And I thought, you know, I, mean, I got a lot of weight on this thing. It won't do nothing. I was going to hit right in the middle of that water and just want to go, you know, out like that. And I hit it. And, buddy, when I hit it, all of a sudden that motorcycle went, and I was looking where I'd been. And, and it went, come around again. And then I, I looked down at the speedometer. It said 65. I said, oh, sweet angels, here I come. Because I know that I ain't going to hit the ground going 65 and live. Well, it was calibrated in kilometers, not miles per hour. But so it really, it was only 37. But friend, I want to tell you something. 37 miles an hour with nothing between you and the asphalt but a pair of britches is rough. And I hit, well, it wasn't too bad at first. All I could think of was getting away from that thing. I went, I mean, it went over, and if it, God, thank God I had a roll bar on it, it probably tore my leg off. I went right under it, and I, I mean, I was kicking away, and buddy, when I hit that wall, whew, 
Matter of fact, I was going so good, I passed the motorcycle up. I mean, wow, right through that. But oh, and it wasn't half bad. And, you know, and I, but when I hit the dry pavement, oh. And you know these folks, they talk about how when you get in an accident, everything goes in slow motion. Man, they're lying to you. Don't you believe that stuff? They, nothing went in slow motion for me. I mean, the whole world just exploded. And I was praying for unconsciousness. I was scooting. And also, pew, there went my britches. See to my britches, man. And I was still going. About by this time, I'd slowed up to about, I think the britches took up a little bit of the blunt of it. I was going about 25 miles an hour. And pew, I went to see to my underwear. Now I'm going about 15 miles an hour. And brother, and after that, he was hiding hair and, and all along the highway. And man, I was, I finally came to land face down by the side of the road and I laid there and the missionary saw it he turned around and he came back and got off and he, he was down on his knees and he had him oh he said brother Jeremy he said oh he said brother are you alive are you alive I said no brother I think I'm dead in hell I'm on fire I'm on fire Oh, man, I mean, I messed up my ribs and tore my leg. And I don't want to tell you what it did to the rest. And, man, I was laying there. And he got up and he went around. And he's, and all these little Nepalese folks come out. They're little tiny folks over there. These little folks, there's all around. They've never seen anything like this. They're all standing around. By this time, I got up on my hands and knees. I was trying to get my breath back and knock the breath out of me. And I just stand there. And all of a sudden, he come and he whispered. He said, Brother Jimmy says, you got to roll over. Roll over. I said, roll over your foot, man. I can't roll over. I'm, I'm on fire. I can't. But Jimmy got to roll over. So he ain't got no britches in the back. He said, I mean, roll over. So I took my coat off, tied it around for an apron. We went on up to the where we was going. But I ain't kidding you. I was sitting real, real gingerly. We got back home and started in the house. There's a little Miss Mary. I was hoping she was in bed, but she wasn't. And I mean, I looked like I'd been through the Boer War. Had to preach that day with an apron, the thing hanging in the back, you know. And all the, I guess all them Nepalese stuff, man, the crazy American, they all wear their coats like that, I guess, you know. Look at that dummy, man. And I had to preach that way. And uh, she took one look at me. She said, Brother Jim. I said, please, Miss Mary, be kind. <laughs> she didn't say, I told you so. But I tell you what, I ain't bragged about riding motorcycles no more. As a matter of fact, I used to pray for motorcycle riders. I'd be on the freeway and I'd say, you don't go by. I said, man, I, gotta pray for, I don't pray for me. Anybody ride a motorcycle, they're beyond your prayers. Oh, they're fools, man. I don't waste my time on that crap. It ain't got no sense. I, you couldn't beat me on one of them things. I, I'd say, you know, and I'd be, I was out in L.A. the other day, and, and, and I see them dummies going down that little white line. I mean, bumper to bumper, and here come, here them fools go 40, 50 miles an hour. I didn't pray for them anymore. I figured, man, there's, there's other folk got sense to pray for, you know. I, but I'll tell you what. And you say, uh, Brother Jim, did God really do all that? Yeah, he do more than that too, friend. That's just some of the humorous things that are humorous now that wasn't humorous then. But God knows how to take care of pride. And brother, that stinks before God. And after you get through the innocent stage and the ignorance and, and you've been through a few battles and if you're not careful, instead of looking up there in shock and say, Oh, no, did I really? Next year about this time, say, Hey, remember all the flags I put up there? Where would this church be without me? <laughs> I mean, I guess I showed them how to do it. If you're not careful, you say, oh, that, yeah, it will happen. Yeah. It will happen. If the devil can't get you one way, friend, he'll come at it, you know, and then I close with the last hurdle. And that's the hurdle after you've been through many of these things, and, and maybe God takes you down to a rock pile or few. There's the hurdle of capitulation, quitting. Everybody gets, I guess, tempted once in a while to quit. Everybody thinks about it. A lot of folk get discouraged. But you know, there's nothing to... What are we going to quit to? Where are we going to go to? I ain't, got, I ain't got nothing back there. I don't, want, I don't want that back there. Where are we going to quit to? What should we do if we do quit? What are we going to do? But some folks get discouraged and preachers do, missionaries do, ordinary, quote unquote, just plain ordinary Christians do, although there is no, no such thing as that term. But, my friend, listen, it's no, it's no time for retreat. It's no time for retreat. And brethren, after you've been through a few battles and, and you see some of the brethren turn tail and run and you 
to see somebody stab you in the back and you and get off of this rock pile and you set out to do something for God and it seems like the thing just deteriorates. Sometimes some folks just throw in the towel and say, I'm done. I'm going to quit. And I'll tell you what, friend. It's already been said and it's true. It takes more than a burden to constitute a call. We've been sitting here, brother. matter of fact, me and Brother Will, uh, 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 Cosby, we was talking about it. I have wanted to go to at least a dozen different places this week. I mean, Brother, oh, when Brother Wilson was showing them slides on Brazil. Good night, if he'd have went 15 more minutes, I'd have jumped up and took up an offer myself for a plane ticket down there. I want to go! I want to go! I want to go to Mexico. I want to go to Brazil. I want to go over yonder to South Africa to that, wherever that place is. I mean, I can't see, I, and I, I, I suppose I see about as many missionary presentations as anybody, and I always want to go. I wonder about folk that don't want to go. But I can't go. That's not what God has for me. And maybe that's not what God has for you. Because I'll tell you what, friend, and my missionary brethren, some of you that have been on the field know it, you that haven't will find it out, the devil can slap every bit of the burden you ever worked up in a year out in six weeks. And if you haven't been called to God, you will not stay. You will not make it. You'll come home on the first boat home. It takes more than a burden. It takes more than some starving children. It takes more than seeing some slides and some wild folks. It takes more than that. It'll take a call of God. Now, God will use a burden. I wouldn't give you a flip-flop for a missionary that couldn't convince me that he had a burden for but if he, if he ain't got no burden I don't know what in the world he's going to do but it takes more than a burden greatest illustration of determination somebody one time asked me said brother Jim is this story true yes sir it's, it's true all these stories are true matter of fact when I was in Alaska most of you know I don't like animals that's an understatement I hate them had a dear lady in the church. Matter of fact, I got in more trouble. The only other thing I get in more trouble over preaching, than, and I don't preach on animals, but I sometimes mention them as illustrations. Uh, I preached one time on Santa Claus. I got cussed by a fine, dedicated Christian fella because I told his kids the truth or something he said. But I got in trouble about that. But I get in more trouble about animals. This lady wanted to talk to me one time. She said, there's something wrong with you. Well, she wouldn't tell me nothing I didn't know. I hadn't known that a long time. But said, something wrong, somebody don't like animals. I said, well, sister, you pray for me. You know, I just don't like them. And I don't. I just, I don't. I, I've got a dog. Matter of fact, the only dog that I ever didn't, that bit me that I didn't kill is at my house right now. He's my watchdog. I got him to be a watchdog. Somebody said, I asked him if he bit. He said, no, he won't bite you. First day, the sucker bit me. I mean, he got me. I was out there and I was putting this thing down the ground, a chain, you know, and he, that's another reason why I don't, I don't like, because I don't like seeing them chained up or caged up. Uh, folk, some folk like to go to a zoo. I believe that borderline's on immoral. Locking them animals up, I honest. Now, this is, please, uh, let me qualify this. This is Brother White's opinion, all right? So if you like to go to the zoo and watch the monkeys and everything, please, don't, don't get mad at me. I just don't get no enjoyment out of that. I, I just, man, the thought of caging me up, man, I, it'd take 15 grown men to get me in a cage. I, I just, and I figure them animals, they probably got enough feels. They don't like to be caged up neither. I, I, just, I just don't like that. I, I don't like that. And, and I don't like animals either. But anyway, I, was, I had to chain this dog up. And, so I was putting this thing down there. And all of a sudden, he's sitting over there. He's going, Rrr. I said, I said, hey, Fido. You know, watch your mouth, man. I'm your new master. You're on dangerous ground, boy. And I was going over. I was going, And I looked over and he had his ears flat down. Hair bristled on his neck. And I don't know how they do it, but they curl their lips back. You don't show them teeth. I said, all right, Fido, it looks like attitude adjustment time for you, turkey. I said, you've got to get things straight right now. So I pulled back my hand, and I went, whoop, and I was going to slap him. And he, whoa, and he got on my hand. I mean, just, I didn't know what to do, man. He had me, you know, and man was rolling around, and he was pretending like Rin Tim Tin, and I was a bad doer. I mean, man was rolling around, whole thing, he had on a choker chain. I finally got him down, and I got that thing on my knee, and I got him, and I says, boom, 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 boom. And then finally, the old dog's tongue lagged out. I said, ah, that's all for him. So I got up. And he just laid there, and I walked in the house, and my wife said, where are you going? I said, well, I'm going to get the shovel. I said, what for? I said, well, I killed the dog. <laughs> she said, you killed the dog? I said, yeah, I killed the dog. Man. I said, he bit me. Look at that. And it, didn't leave, it just didn't break the skin, but left a big mark, you know, bruise. So she walked out, and she looked, and said, no, I said, he, he's still breathing. He ain't dead yet. I said, wait till I find the shovel. 
Well, I didn't kill him because I come to my senses before I found the shovel, but I thought, well, you know, I mean, if he'll, if he'll bite the master, what do you suppose he'd do to a bad doer? So I keep him around, see? But I don't like animals. I don't understand animals. And that's another, I don't know why God called me to Alaska, but I went anyway. Huh? Now up in Alaska, um, uh, I, I, I don't like dogs, but I hate cats. <sighs> hate cats. Just can't stand them. But something I hate worse than a cat, and that's a rat. And uh, up in Alaska, we had these little animals called shrews. Miss Sherry, this is special for you. We got these little shrews. Now, the difference between a shrew and a mouse is legion. A little shrew don't get but about that big. But if you've seen him in a distance, you'd think it was a little mouse with his tail cut off because he got a little short stubby tail and a long pointed nose. But that's where the similarity ends. Ounce for ounce, hair for hair, there ain't nothing more vicious on the face of God's earth than a shrew. If they got as big as a dog, man, there wouldn't be none of us alive today. And we was blessed with them. I mean to tell you, they eat me out of house and home. I never did catch one in a conventional trap. I made one of my own. I invented one. I got me a five-gallon can. I drilled a hole through it, put a wire through it with a Maxwell House coffee can. I filled it up with about a gallon and a half of water, and I took this coffee can, greased it up with bacon grease. I built me a little ramp up to it, and I caught 39 one night. They'd walk up there, jump off to get that grease, and poop in the water, and I'd lay there and listen going, squeaky, 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 you know, until they drowned, and I, I got a big kick out of listening to them. <laughs> But man, we had shrews, and so I went out and I got a book, read up on them. This fellow wrote this book, and he said, these shrews, he said, and their heartbeats and their metabolism is so fast, said they got to eat five times their normal body weight every day just to exist. That ain't getting fat, man, that's just existing. So well, praise God, I don't mind that, but man, they're all hanging out in my house. I'm feeding the whole crew. Yeah. And he said their heart beats so fast that if you could sneak up behind one of them and clap your hands or make a loud noise, said it'd have a heart attack and it'd kill it. Well, I just read all this stuff, you know, and filed it away. And One night I was laying out there on the floor in front of the fire stove and reading my Bible. Out of the corner of my eye, I saw something in the kitchen. Now, the difference between a shrew and a mouse, if a mouse came in, you probably wouldn't see him. They slink around little baseboards and all. Not a shrew. This dude come walking right down the middle of my kitchen floor like he owned the place. I looked at her and said, man, the audacity of that little rascal. I wouldn't have felt half bad if he'd slink like a mouse, but he's walking right down the middle of my kitchen floor. He's coming right toward me. So I'll fix him. He doesn't know it, but I am armed with printed material that he knows not anything about. I got the goods on that dude. I backed up behind the stove and I waited. Didn't take long. Here, little dude, come right out there. I had him. Right in the middle of my living room. I just leaped out. I whapped right on my stomach, right in the middle of the floor. I clapped my hands. And I said, Boo! And I figured, you know, poor little dude's dead in a hammer. And there I was, about this far from that guy. The little fella didn't even flinch. He went down on his hunkers real quick. Bristled the hair up on his neck. Curled them little lips off the ugliest little needle yellow fangs I've ever seen in my life. That little guy, every muscle in his little body was tense like a spring. And there I was, that far away, looking at two of the coldest, stony, beady eyes I've ever seen. And that little dude started making a noise, and I... Honestly, I'd have put my hand on this Bible and said, that thing can't make that noise. He can't be saying all that. He got down there and he said, <laughs> Man, I almost had a heart attack. <laughs> and at that moment, if I could have got my hands around the neck of the man that wrote that book, I'd have choked him until his eyeballs bugged out. And I don't know how I'd done it. But I jumped from a prone position. I went clean up into the couch. My wife was upstairs. I said, hey, mama, throw me my gun. Man, I was going to kill him. Well, he stood there for a minute and saw there ain't no fighting this dude. He just turned around and walked out. Well, I said, all that, say this. I went out the next day and I got me a cat. Got me a cat. I hate cats, but I got me a cat. Went out and got me a cat and got him a scurf of the neck. I think my daughters called him Garfield. I called him Killer. Trying to help him psychologically because I knew he had his job cut out for him. I got him up there eyeball to eyeball. I said, all right, Killer. 
I just want you to know this right now. I hate cats. And I hate you. You don't know how much I hate you. And I said, you're here for one reason. I don't know how much he understood, but I said, you're here for one reason. To kill shrews. And I said, you do that and you got a home. You don't. And you're dead meat turkey. And I threw him down on the ground. And then your cats, they, they, and the one thing bad about a cat, a dog don't do this, but a cat. They got to run in your legs and rub all over. Oh, that just aggravating. It took me three days to break that cat of that. You got a cat does that, you want him broke? I got it refined down to a day and a half now. But anyway, I got him broke in. He didn't stay in the house either. You know, somebody said, it, 50, 50 below is about as cold as it got up around where we was. It wasn't too, too cold up there. But I said, man, that cat won't make it. I said, oh, yeah, well, he did. You know, listen, before folks started treating animals like humans, yeah. they used to all live outside. They used to all live outside. And, now, this is no, I ain't going to get in that because I don't want nobody to get mad at me tonight. This is a wind-up service here. I don't want to get in that subject. Got some good stories about that, too, but uh, let's go on. But so I got this cat. Well, lo and behold, not another shrew in the house. I was great. One morning, I come out about 5 o'clock in the morning. I was going to go down to the church. I came out, and there's a little porch there. Brother Nelson, been there where Brother Paul used to live, probably down in the Nilchick. And the little porch, and there's a big driveway there. The house sits on a three-acre field, and there's 75 million acres all around it. And, 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 and I heard this awful noise. And here was my cat killer and this little old shrew over here. And there's a fighting. I never saw anything like it in my life. I stood on the porch and I watched and I noticed the little shrew didn't try to run away. And I noticed I watched and he actually attacked in my cat. Honest before God, he jumped on my cat. I don't know if he's the same one who coosted me or not. But I watched and I was, man, I was rooting for my cat. I said, kill him, get him, kill him. I said, oh, don't let him do that to you. Get him. He jumped up and got my cat by the shoulder and they rolled around. And, man, that cat making awful noise. That shrew going, rawr, rawr. I mean, they just going to it. That shrew never backed down one time. And before I knew it, all of a sudden, I started getting a change of heart. I said, this little shrew, man. And I started rooting for the shrew. I said, oh, Sammy, don't watch it, Sammy, don't know. He's going to get you on the blind side, boy. I said, look at you, you yellow boy. Watch out for your blind on the left side, man. He's tearing you up over there. I come, come in for a ride. And I, you know, because my wife says I get involved in things sometimes. I get carried away. But I was really rooting for him, you know. And so all of a sudden, and, and man, we're going. And I mean, I'm watching this thing about 20 minutes, you know. All of a sudden, the window goes up in the bedroom. And my wife stuck her head out. She says, hey, preacher, she said, you know what time it is? I said, no, mama. She said, what are you doing? I said, listen, Mama. I said, this is the fight of the century. I said, in this corner, Sammy the Shrew weighing in at two ounces. Three grams. In this corner, over here, killer the cat. Seven pounds, 13 ounces. I said, honey, they're locked in mortal combat. And I said, I ain't leaving till the fight's over. I said, and if that shrew whips my cat, or my cat backs down from that shrew, me and the cat's going to the dump. Name but one of us coming back. And I watched him, and man, that little shrew kept jumping at the cat. And uh, he'd bite the cat, and those shrews, they have poison. They actually have venom in their fangs. Not enough to hurt a, a human or, or something as big as a cat. But uh, they keep fighting and fighting. Finally, the little shrew, he jumped at the cat. And the cat made a fancy sidestep, and he went, whoop, and he bit that shrew's head clean off. Coolest thing I've ever seen in my life. That little old shrew, man, he went tumbling. He laid down on the ground like this going. Just little feet kicking, 90 mile an hour. Blood squirting out his head. He ain't got a whole lot of blood, but it is gone, you know. And I walked over there and I looked at old little Sammy there. If I'd have had a trumpet, I'd have played taps for the dude. And there was just a kick and I kicked him with my foot a little bit. So yeah, dead and hammer. Still jerking though. Still kick. Look at this dude. He's still kicking. He still ain't afraid of that cat. And I said, boy, I said, I'll tell you what. I told my wife, I said, man, I, said, I see more fighting that shrew without a head than in some preachers that got a head on the shoulder and a strong pack and brother, a Bible under their arm. And that poor old shrew's got more fight in him than some preachers. My Christian brother, sister, man, don't quit. Don't quit. Don't quit. Press the attack. The time is short. Jesus Christ is coming back. It's no time to retreat. He's telling the preacher about a story. Chesty Puller was a Marine and Colonel in there in the Second World War. 
It was on a particular island. I don't know what it was, but the Japanese were charged. It was the first time that anybody ever experienced a bonsai attack. And his lieutenant called up from one of the front posts. And he said, Colonel, he said, request permission to withdraw. And he said, why? He said, our position is in imminent danger of being overrun by the Japanese. He said, well, shoot the... I'll blank that one out there. And he said, but sir, we're out of ammunition. Request permission to withdraw. He said, and, 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 and poor God got it from his radio operator who was relaying it. He got on, he said, listen here, fella. He said, did the Marine Corps issue you a bayonet when you joined up? He said, yes, sir. He said, well, I suggest you use it then. And friend, listen. There's some Christians, we got issued some stuff, and I'd hate to go to heaven. Never having taken a clip out of the belt. Yeah. I'd hate to go to heaven. Never having taken my bayonet out and put it on the end of my gun and got some blood on it. I'd hate to go to heaven with all my bullets still in the magazine. Glory to God, shoot the last shot, fight with a bayonet till you break it off, then beat them over the head with a butt of a gun. But don't quit. Don't quit. Don't quit. There's too many quit. Don't quit. Let's pray. The hurdles. The hurdles. A long life road. Ignorance. But sometimes when knowledge sets in, fear will set in. And all after you've gotten across that hurdle, that insidious hurdle of pride, the highest hurdle of them all. And then sometimes after you've stumbled over a few of those, and I'll grant you this, my Christian brother or sister tonight, sometime between now and the next mission conference, you will be tempted quit the fellow sitting out at Joe's bar and grill tonight didn't backslide off of a bar stool he backslid sitting where you're sitting tonight you'll be tempted to quit you'll be tempted to quit listening first tempted to quit telling it tempted to quit giving and finally tempted to quit going. Sometime during this year, when all the hoopaloo's over, the emotions have settled, if it was really God, don't quit. And if it wasn't, why don't you get your rotten heart right with God and get in the fight? My missionary brothers, Wherever you go, you remember about folk like this at home, holding the ropes. My brother, don't quit. Don't quit. When you're out on the field and it's dark and it's lonely and it's cold, you remember there's some folk back home that love you and are praying for you. Don't quit.